All right, welcome back. In case you're just joining us, it's time for our conversation. We're looking at the electricity uh, market and uh, the zigzag and the abracadabra that is happening <laughs> in that sector. Kalu Koha is joining me right now. He's the Chief Executive Officer at Energy Support Group Africa. Mr. Koha, good to see you again and welcome to the program. Thank you for having me again and uh, compliments of the season. Nancy. Compliments to you too. Like I said earlier, the abracadabra in this sector, um, a sector that is quite technical, that a lot of people do not understand. What they understand there is the Naira and Cobalt part of it in terms of paying for electricity or when they come and say, uh, I should pay for estimated billing and all of that. So let's quickly start with the confusion of the last few days. Uh, Nick said the media was reporting, uh, was giving false reports about an increase in tariffs and all of that. So can you please make sense of what happened at least in the last few days? Thank you, Nancy. And uh, just for the benefit of uh, our viewers, it's, it's always nice to put things in context. So um, at the conception of this privatization, the, the MITRE order made allowance for minor reviews of the tariff and major reviews. Uh, the minor reviews are supposed to happen once every six months to take care of uh, uh, minor issues, including inflation and fluctuations in, in foreign currency, while the major um, reviews are, should be done once every five years. And uh, what you found is that since uh, the uh, privatization in 2013, uh, there's been no minor review uh, and major review. There was a, a major review in 20, 2013, which was reversed. And so you, you, you found that the tariff has remained static. So I think that what you saw um, last week was a minor review, which originally is supposed to happen every six months. So you find that um, in the last six months, we've had changes in inflation. And we've also had some devaluation. Um, you were just in your previous session, you were just talking about um, how the dollar has kept going high. And so there was need for a minor review. And so um, that's, in my sense, what I thought was going on. But there's been back and forth. And as usual, we've seen um, the summer salt coming from the government side and the regulator. So um, at present, we don't really know exactly uh, where we are. There's need for more clarity as to where what the tariff uh, changes are. So from, uh, in other words, um, Nigerians should expect minor reviews, of course, from MITO, minor reviews occasionally, and major reviews perhaps as the year go by. Um, would, would you really say that there, there was an increase in tariffs, at least in the last few days? Because NEC did say, and I also saw the tweets from the uh, Minister of uh, Power about the two to four Naira per kilowatt band. So would you say there was an increase and just explain that to our viewers? So um, during the minor reviews, like I said, you adjust for um, the upward, up or down trend in inflation and foreign exchange uh, fluctuations. And so um, we know that inflation has gone up by um, a few uh, digits uh, and, and then the foreign exchange uh, uh, dollar to naira rates have also gone up so you would expect that these adjustments would lead to um, a slight increase in um, in the tariff um, but the point that i, I want to make is that these minor and major uh, adjustments were inherent in the agreements that uh, were part of the uh, uh, the reforms that came into being in 2013. And so we've seen over time, because of political situations, as you can see right now, that keeps making government go back and forth. And the question is um, reliability or affordability. Um, on one hand, the government makes a case that people can't afford the increases. But on the other hand, everybody's complaining about the poor quality of service. And clearly we know to improve the quality of service we need to invest in the infrastructure. And the way uh, the system is structured, it's only a cost-reflective tariff that can, that can help that. And so it's this back and forth that we keep going, that you don't know, the, like the Americans who say catch 22, which one comes before which? Do you increase the tariff 
before you get reliable service or do you begin to give reliable service before people are willing to pay for it? And now, so we've been on this for many years. Every beginning of the year, we I'm sit down you. and review. I'm and telling review, you. Um, <laughs> the power sector. <laughs> Not only power. It's... <laughs> For and years, you read the tea leaves, uh, and um, I don't want to be sounding like uh, a, a naysayer, but uh, each time we look at this and and we try to give uh, our humble um, opinions. Uh, at the end of the day, they, they turn out to still be right, and so um, privatization is not a magic wand. I've argued um, many times that a mere handover. Uh, of state-owned enterprise to private hands does not automatically uh, lead to better performance if the necessary structures and conditions are not in place. And so we keep seeing these somersaults back and forth. Um, initially, we thought it was only going to be payment risks, but regulatory risk is also a big problem. And so you see policy somersaults back and forth. So um, it's, it's a very difficult place that we find ourselves now. You know, um, I know since we privatized, um, there have been a few issues, and I think one of the major issues is about this tariff because uh, the, the discos, the distributors will say, if you pay us what is due to us, you would definitely have light. Let me come down primarily so that people will understand what I'm, what I'm saying. So it's about um, if you pay the money, you get the service. So why has it really been so dicey for us to get it right. Since we've been talking about the spa, a lot of people would say, okay, uh, the state-owned companies that were privatized were given to government cronies and their friends and, and well-wishers and all of that. How do we now get this right? Because there seems to be a lot of somersault around that sector. No, there's electricity tariff increase. They will say, no, we did not. Labor will say, oh, go back. So. Like you said, we've been on this issue for many years. So, Nancy, um, philosophically speaking, the country needs to come to terms with exactly um, the direction, the policy trust that we want to follow. Do we want um, electricity to be a social service or do we want it to be a commodity? Um, keep in mind, the, the sole reason why we're where we are today is because there was a consensus that the huge uh, requirements, financial requirements to turn around the sector couldn't come from the government. In fact, government does not have that, does, uh, that, that kind of money. And so um, the idea of uh, private uh, participation came in place. And so at the, at the basis of that is the um, uh, cost reflective tariff, uh, which is supposed to bear the costs and incentivize private investment. And so we keep finding uh, up to now. And over the time, even the World Bank's uh, recovery plan, which set out very clear uh, pathway to uh, the recovery of the sector, agreed that uh, um, a, 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 a cost reflective tariff was, was the way to go. And also um, uh, tried to put some money on the table, which led to the, um, the tariff increase you saw late last year. But the back and forth now does not. You remember the last time we talked about this recovery plan? We talked about the PIP, which uh, was supposed to be the plan for the next five years. So we need to um, be on. And I keep saying that um, government is responsible for both the policy and it, it, I might argue regulation. So between policy and regulation, um, they should be able to whip the players in, in, in place. But we need to um, get the right things. The, the fundamentals are still not, not in place. I'm sorry to say that. Would you, would you briefly just explain the tariff methodology? Because we have what we call the cost reflexive tariffs. There's sometime last year, towards the end of last year, there was something that was called the service based tariffs or something, you know, uh, within the categories of A to E, if I'm not mistaken. So can you? <laughs> Can you just briefly explain? I said at the beginning of the program that, of course, the electricity sector is, is seemingly a technical sector. A lot of science-based ba science methodology in, in it, but, you know, also a bit of common sense and mathematics. So just explain that. W which tariff methodology are we using now? So, Nancy, um, let me shock you. There's nothing to 
terribly technical about uh, power sector. We just try to make it very complex to maybe uh, confuse people. I mean, the sector is not different from any other sector. Uh, so um, the cost tariff, the cost reflective tariff is still generally accepted uh, um, tariff methodology that you, you find uh, people practicing this. We just came up with uh, uh, the service uh, reflective tariff just to make sure that um, you don't charge people uh, where the, there is no uh, value in service. And so we we were, we spoke on this forum sometime last year where I tried to explain that uh, the new uh, tariff uh, order only comes effect to where people are experiencing more than 12 hours, uh, uh, a minimum of 12 hours uh, availability um, over over the month and does not apply to people who don't have that kind of service and does not also affect to the the, the least band which uh, which is the rural poor. Um, basically, that's what the service reflective tariff means. Um, we need to review whether the few months that has been operational, what the um, uh, the results have been. Um, you know, I shared with you some of my uh, reservations about it, about the ability to track uh, the capacity of the regulator to track uh, the uh, distribution companies on this service reflective tariff. Um, I think that capacity gaps are very evident and it will be very difficult, if not almost impossible, to ensure that these uh, service, service levels are, are, are monitored. Let's talk about the NP, NMMP, the National Mass Metering Program that was launched last year, announced by uh, Mr. President to be financed by uh, the Central Bank in terms of looking at the financing component of it. Where do you think we are right now vis-a-vis -vis that we're still plagued with the pandemic? The pandemic definitely inhibited uh, logistics, inhibited a bit of manufacturing last year. Uh, where do you think we are right now on that? Um, Nancy, I'll just refer you to the numbers. Uh, I mean, the uh, the regulator publishes quarterly uh, reports on on the sector, and you find that in terms of metering, there's been no um, improvement quarter by quarter um, as at the last uh, quarterly report that NEC sent out. And so it goes back to the issue that I, I talked about. We had CAPME before. We discussed CAPME, and then NEC threw away CAPME and brought the uh, the map. We discussed map, and I shared with you some of my uh, reservations on map. And suddenly, the federal government wants to meet everybody. And so you keep seeing uh, policy uh, back and forth, and then uh, it it affect, affects uh, the whole operation of the sector. And then the private sector who will just be sitting and, and looking. And so when there's no uh, certainty um, for future cash flows, this is the problem that you see uh, times like this when we can just... Uh, and I've always been advocating for a, a very structured uh, governance structure that can uh, um, harmonize the policy and regulation aspect so that the players uh, uh, can follow. Uh, every, every time we keep changing the goalpost. And so um, if you look at the numbers, um, you can't you cannot say that the the numbers have shown that uh, this this recent policy has been a success but uh, this is a new year um I, i'm very optimistic and i look forward to um better engagement with the system and, and the annoying part is that africa is moving forward we're talking about after now um our experience in east africa and, and all that is that governments are, are being more um practical be more uh, practical in, in their strategies. And so um, after it's a, it's, it's a wake up call for Nigeria and, and our normal argument of saying uh, giant of Africa with the population might not uh, all go well for us when after kick, kicks, kicks off. Mm. Uh, I think it has, it has January 1, 2021. So for those of us that will say, oh, Nigeria is the largest market in Africa. I think we should begin to see that it may not be the largest market in again because the aftermarket is the largest, which is 1.2 billion people. So if you don't position yourself there, 1.2 billion minus 206 million, do the math. The rest of the uh, continent will leave us and we'll still be reeling in our, you know, big money. Nancy, it's, it's, not even like the, <laughs> no, it's not even, it's not even, it's not even, that's not even my argument. My argument is that Africa is one market now. So if yes. it is, it's cheaper to produce anything in another country 
they can move the products here at very cheap cost. So um, that whole argument that uh, a, a, a manufacturing concern has to be in Nigeria is defeated because water. if you can, pro it doesn't hold water if you can manufacture if electricity is cheaper and more reliable in that country and they're able to manufacture superior products at cheaper prices. Obviously, they are going to manufacture it there and, and bring it through the borders to Nigeria. I mean, it's one market now. So I think that we need to begin to uh, 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 think very strategically when it comes to um, how, how to improve our electricity outcomes in Nigeria. I think that um, if you ask me, we should concentrate on reliability and then affordability will come. It is better to have reliable power um, and I and I was if we have reliable power, if we have reliable power from your own analysis, where would it leave the discos? Because they are also looking for money. I think if you take a look at the discos, perhaps they are the weakest link in that sector right now. Because it's even the discos that will get money that would, you know, distribute along the value chain. The reason why our infrastructure. The reason why we have poor outcomes of low reliability, poor reliability, is because our infrastructure is obsolete and bad, and you need money to fix them. So if you fix the tariff, you can fix the infrastructure, and you have rela reliable power. Um, the other day, Manufacturer Association of Nigeria was complaining that the recent increase is too high. But on the other hand, uh, the manufacturers are paying huge sums of money for diesel uh, generators to to run their, their their manufacturing lines and reliable power uh, through the, the the mains would be ultimately cheaper. So I mean we need to be serious as to how we think. I think personally, and I could be wrong about it. What we need is reliable power at the right price. Um, with reliable power, you're going to have more demand for it, and then uh, more people would come into place, and then it could affect price. Uh, it could bring down price. Um, at the beginning, if you recall, um, 20 years ago when um, GSM came out, I bought my SIM for 20,000 naira. I bought my SIM card for 20,000 naira. Today, SIM is free. I mean, it might even come with free um, free minutes. That's what you you gain when you have uh, the critical mass around you. So for me, I argue, and I've argued in different African countries that yes, um, affordability is very important. And we need to look at that, but we need we need reliable power to to run our commercial and industrial um, sectors. Um, since you raised uh, other African countries, which other African country uh, do you think has gotten its power right? Is there is there so, an African um, country we can copy from? So in the last two years, I've been working mostly in East Africa, um, Kenya, and Uganda. And if you look at, there's an FDB uh, uh, electricity index which they publish annually. And you find countries like Uganda and Kenya and some of those other countries, you know, uh, way ahead in the, in the risk. Whether that is in access, whether that is in sustainability, whether that is in regulatory risk. And so um, I, I think even in the operation of their, uh, their entities, although you would say Uganda, their, their reform has... Uh, uh, has been on for more than 19, 20 years. So they are ahead of Nigeria in terms of maturity curve. But um, you, there's a consistent uh, action towards trying to, and in those countries, they realize their comparative advantages and their uh, weak points, and they try to build on them. Now, Nigeria, I think we, over time, we've tried to do a national industrialization policy where we try to say what our uh, strong areas are uh, comparative advantage, but consistently we've tried to undermine those, and we've not built, uh, uh, built, uh, built it up over time. And so that's why I worry because um, uh, my personal experience working with these governments in the East and South African um, space um, shows that they're they're way ahead of us in terms of uh, uh, policy and regulatory stability. Mm. Okay, let, let's talk about the deal that a lot of people were so optimistic about last year, the federal government Siemens deal um, that, you know, would be in three phases, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we're currently at around generation capacity of about 7,000 megawatts uh, to take us to about 11,000, 25,000 between 2021, 2023. Now we're in 2021. We seem not to have been hearing anything around that space since May of 2020, I guess, when the contract was signed. 
uh, if I'm not mistaken, because I think the CEO of uh, the company uh, came to Nigeria. You are in that space. Have you heard anything I haven't heard? Well, Nancy, uh, your guess is as good as mine. Um, so um, some of us are not in government, so maybe a lot of things are happening behind uh, the stage, but um, I'm not, personally, I'm not aware of uh, uh, any uh, substantial uh, movements. I recall we discussed this uh, cement uh, issue some time ago, and uh, we tried to uh, look at the deal as it affects the present arrangement where you have uh, private investors as the owners of the distribution company while government is coming with that. And so um, whatever plan must have a decent handshake and must, uh, and must be structured in, a, in such a way that uh, everybody will be very comfortable with the action. But I must tell you that uh, I've not seen anything. Uh, the first the first phase is supposed to take us to about 7,000 mm -hmm. megawatts. Or, and we've not, uh, I mean, last week, uh, I think the federal government celebrated a peak of uh, 5,500 megawatts. That's just the peak, but the average, uh, uh, the average generation still remains within the 4,000 mark. So in real terms, there's really not been any, any movement uh, and our population, uh, whereas our population is increasing. I hear we are above 200 million now. We're still struggling with 4,000. 206 million, I was told last year by the National Population Commission. So, so our population is, is increasing, uh, but uh, our real, real generation uh, is static. So that says it all. Mm. Is, th is, th is this market still a viable market for private investors? Because we have, how many discos do we have? 11, you know, so with the discos, uh, n not having a rosy time right now in the market or since this privatization, uh, is, is this seemingly a viable market? In, in our, in our, in our, um, in our modeling, um, Nigeria is a very viable market. Um, like you said, 206 million people. And you find that the challenges we have in Nigeria is actually the reverse of what you find in some countries in, 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 uh, East and, and South, uh, Eastern Africa. For example, I mean, um, in Uganda, for example, you have excess excess supply. So there is so much power and there's nobody to take it. In is it Nigeria, because of you the, have the, the population is not as, we are, there are not as many as we are here? Not necessarily. They have the capacity, they have the generation capacity, but they don't even have the demand. We here, we have demand. And why I say the, the market here is very, uh, uh, it's out there to be taken, you find that even self-generation accounts for the larger part of the generation we have here. And so when, for example, a, a Baba who, um, who does not have power goes to buy a generator, he still, his generator is on, which means that he has, he has business, he has demand that drives his business. And so he goes to buy uh, a fuel at, a, at an exorbitant price just to keep his business going, which means that, um, there is huge market for uh, for electricity here, so I think that uh, we just need to position ourselves so that we can take advantage of the opportunities that we find uh, uh, around. But I still would go back to policy and regulatory um, uh, issues that uh, we've seen uh, not synchronized uh, in, in in the recent past. Let's take the next two three minutes as we round off to talk about this national mass metering program. Uh, when it was announced last year, it seems it was a good policy. I think one million meters to be distributed, that's still a shortfall compared to uh, the population uh, that we have uh, in the country. How much of a game changer do you think that a national mass metering program uh, would be? Because we're talking about perhaps local manufacturers coming in, uh, creating jobs. Uh, the financing framework, like I said earlier, by the central bank for even discos or the manufacturers rather to take advantage of that facility, uh, interest rates of less than double digit, I think either nine percent or so, um, a moratorium of two years. So, how much of a game changer do you think it is, and should the federal government fast track that program? Well, Nancy, we. We are very optimistic. Uh, we hope that uh, we'll see better um, 
delivery of this plan. And as you know, um, there's always a big difference between uh, great plans and outcomes. Uh, we are not in short supply of uh, fantastic ideas and plans, but the implementation is usually an issue. Um, how well is government uh, better placed to play this role? I mean, we've given uh, this role to the private sector, and we say the discourse can't meet her. We go back to um, establishing very uh, brand new meta asset provider companies, and then and then this again. So um, we we're optimistic, and we hope that uh, this time we'll see some major movements in terms of metering because uh, metering is is the heart of distribution. Without uh, a fair sense of uh, 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 costing and payment, then you keep having these issues about uh, estimated billing and uh, collection uh, losses. Mm. Okay. Um, your final word concerning this uh, uh, topic. Is there anything the Ministry of Power is doing that it shouldn't do or it should be doing? Is there anything the next should do? Um, just your final word. Or are they doing some things right? Too? Well, I, I don't think I'm in the position to advise the ministry. Um, you I think are. You play in that answer. sector. You are not um, in that sector. You watch what's happening. Um, but for the the regulatory agency, I think they have a new uh, um, a new um, management in place. I, I, I was thinking that this new arrangement of an, allowing the minor reviews to go was a good reflection of. Uh, the new um, focus of the of the new um, regulatory uh, board because we need some level of certainty. Uh, okay. We don't want regulatory somersaults and all that. If, so if if the players can have some level of comfort in terms of uh, a regulator's approach, then we would would have gone a step further. Okay, I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Carlo Koha, for joining me today. And I hope we don't Thank talk about much. this again in the next few months. That even if we are talking about it, it will be okay. We've moved from this level to that level in the positive. I hope, I hope so too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nancy. All right. <laughs> I'll be speaking with Carlo Koha, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Energy Support Group Africa. We've been talking about the electricity market in the country. All right, it's time for us uh, to take our CBN Weekly our segment, we will be x-raying the palm oil industry. I did say earlier that uh, Nigeria's palm oil industry is the fifth largest. Uh, we're the largest consumer palm oil in Africa. According to the Central Bank of Nigeria, if we harness the chain or the industry, we should be getting about $20 billion from, palm oil, from the palm oil industry alone yearly. So let's uh, check out what the central bank is doing uh, in that uh, sector. That's uh, a bye-bye from me now. You get to see my face again tomorrow, same time on this station. Don't forget that you can join us on all our social media platforms. Be the best you can be. Don't forget to wear your mask, wash your hands, or sanitize it. I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye now.